okay uh, we'll get started with today's class and uh, everything we cover until today's class is part of your uh, midterm one syllabus and as i mentioned in the class you will get 24 hours to solve midterm one now what we have to decide in this class today is what is that 24 hour window should it be 12 midnight to 12 midnight should it be 9 pm to 9 pm should it be 12 midday to 12 midday 12 noon to 12 noon what's your preference or no preference <laughs> i could do midnight to midnight uh, that's not a big problem but i'm not sure if anyone wants to work all the way to midnight or not it's going to be a, so i have to be able to solve the the midterm in 10 minutes so i'm expecting you will solve it in one hour and I'm also expecting you will solve it during the class hours. Like that's, that's why there is no class and you will spend that one hour of the class to solve the midterm. That would have been the ideal case. Uh, but, uh, but I'm giving you 24 hours so that you have enough flexibility. You can pick whichever one hour you want to use to solve the midterm. So would midnight to midnight be okay with everyone? Okay, so 12 midnight to 13th midnight, yes. So you want 32 hours? No, if you do like noon to noon, so like... Oh, noon to noon? Yeah, no. so like if you're sleeping, right, from midnight to 8 a.m., and you release the exam at midnight, it's on the day. Yeah, I could see like an 8 a.m. So, so I could do 8 a.m. to 8 a.m.? Yeah. yeah, 8 a.m. Okay, 8 a.m., but that 8 a.m. will then eat into your uh, vacation, like the spring break. Yeah, that's, okay. that's okay? Okay. <laughs> I guess most of you who are saying it's okay are graduate students. You don't have vacation. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right, so it'll be 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, that should be okay. So 8 a.m. on 13th, I'll upload the midterm. You will have an entire 24 hour period and next 8 a.m. it will be due. All right, so we talked about Lagrange multiplier theorem in the previous class. And the problem is I want to solve minimize fx x in Rn hx equal to zero. So I have some nonlinear constraints, equality constraints, and I want to minimize the function whenever those constraints are is met. And the Lagrange multiplier theorem says that if x star is optimal and regular. or x star is local minimum and regular, then there exists lambda star in Rm such that gradient f x star plus summation lambda i star gradient hi x star is equal to zero. And then d transpose second derivative So this is what we had proved. Well, we had proved the first statement and the second statement proof also follows in using a similar line of thought. But we didn't really prove the second part, the, the second order necessary condition. We only proved the first order necessary condition. So this is my FONC. This is my second order necessary condition. And this is the this whole theorem is known as Lagrange multiplier theorem. <clears throat> now remember, 
that this is a necessary conditions for optimality. So any point that satisfies these conditions, so the, not just a point, so it's not just x star, but there also has to be a lambda star. So any x star lambda star pair that satisfies these conditions is only a candidate for optimal solution. It need not be optimal solution because it only satisfies the necessary conditions for optimality. What I'm going to do next is let's try to solve a convex problem using this approach, I mean using this theorem, and try to find a candidate optimal solution and the corresponding Lagrange multiplier pair for, uh, for the convex problem. So I want to minimize half of x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square such that x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to 1. Maybe I want to make it a little bit interesting. Uh, how do I make it interesting? I want to maybe add a number somewhere. Let me make it 2. So now it's not symmetric. So now x1 will not be equal to x2 will not be equal to x3. OK. So this is the problem I want to solve. OK. Uh, so there will be a Lagrange multiplier. We only have one constraint here. So there will be a Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this one constraint. So I have four unknowns here, x1 star, x2 star, x3 star, and lambda star. I don't know these four quantities. So I have four unknowns, so I need four equations to be able to determine those unknowns. So what are the four equations? So this will provide me with three equations. Remember, the gradient of fx star is a three-dimensional vector for this case. So I have three dimensions, uh, so I have three equations equal to zero here. So I know I can get three equations from here. Where is the fourth equation going to come from? That's going to come from hx star equal to zero. So that will be my step one, uh, which is Four equations, four unknowns. So let's try to get those four equations. X1 star, X2 star, and then to x3 star. That's my gradient of fx star. Plus lambda star. What's my gradient of h x star? Can someone tell me what the gradient of h x star is? I actually have to put it in h x equal to zero form. So let me put it in this form. So x1, x2 plus x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus 1 equal to zero. So that's my h of x. With the negative 1 sign. So that's my h of x. So what's the gradient of h evaluated at x star? 1, 1, 1, one, one right? And this should be equal to 0. 
and then I have h of x star equal to 0. So I get three equations here. So x1 star plus lambda star equal to 0, x2 star plus lambda star equal to 0, and 2x3 star plus lambda star equal to 0. So I have three equations from here. And the fourth equation will come from h of x star equal to 0. So I have x1 star plus x2 star plus x3 star equals to 1. So that's my fourth equation. It's a linear set of equations. And there are four unknowns. Can we solve it? We can solve it, right? Okay, so I'm going to erase the step one and I'm going to start expanding all these four equations to solve them. And that's my step two. So I have x1 star plus lambda equals to zero, x2 star plus lambda equals to zero, 2x3 star plus lambda equals to 0. So this gives me x1 star equals to minus lambda, x2 star equals to minus lambda, x3 star equals to minus lambda over 2. Oh, I should use lambda star. Okay, and then I have x1 star plus x2 star plus x3 star is equal to what do I get? minus 5 lambda star over 2 equals to 1. I get the value of lambda star as minus 2 over 5. So now that I got the value of lambda star, I can substitute it here and I can get a value for x1 star, x2 star and x3 star. So this is 2 over 5, 2 over 5, 1 over 5. So in the exam, there will be one question of this type. I would expect you to do the step one and then step two, solve the four unknowns, four equations, four unknown problem, and then be able to compute this x1 star, x2 star, and x3 star. Okay, fairly straightforward calculation, but it's good to know how, what are the sequence of steps you need to take in order to get to the solution. Now, like I mentioned, this is a necessary condition for optimality. So x star uh, as this vector and lambda star equals to minus 2 over 5, it satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. It would also satisfy the second order necessary condition for optimality because the second derivative of f is going to be a, a positive definite matrix. Let's do the second, second derivative part as well. 
So let's see whether this x1 star, x2 star, x3 star, and lambda star satisfies the second order necessary condition or not. So I don't want to delete this side, but I'm restricted by the real estate on the board. So let me write the optimal solution, or at least the candidate optimal solution. Okay, so I'm going to erase this side of the board. I hope everyone has written this part. Okay. So in order to check the second condition, let me write step three. So step three is only needed if you want to check that the second order necessary condition is satisfied by this point or not. So let me compute V of X star first. So if you remember, V of X star is D in R3 such that gradient of H X star transpose D is equal to zero. <clears throat> so I'm writing gradient of hx star because hx is one dimensional, like the range of hx is one dimensional. But if h were multi-dimensional, then I'll have gradient of hi x star transpose t for all i. So this means v of x star is d in rn, r3, such that the gradient of hx star is 1, 1, 1, d equals to 0, d in rn, such that summation of di, i equals 1 to 3. Those are the set of all feasible variations at x star. The three components of d must add to 0. So I could have 1, 1, minus 2, or I could have minus 1, 1, 0. Those are all part of V of x star. Any questions so far? Okay, so this is the set of first order feasible variations. Now what I have to check is that x star and lambda star satisfies this particular O. It are right equal to zero, greater than equal to zero. Please correct the second order necessary condition. This should be greater than equal to zero. Uh, so all I have to check is for every D in that particular set, this condition must hold. So let's, let's check that. So that's going to be my step four. So what's my second derivative of f of x star? Can someone tell me what this is going to be? Yeah, one, one, two. That is the second derivative. What about second derivative of H at X star? What is that going to be? Zero. So that's my second derivative. Now this is a positive definite matrix, right? Because it's uh, diagonal entries are strictly positive. 
So this condition obviously holds for all D, including D in Vx star. So D transpose Right, so that the second order necessary condition is satisfied in this situation. Okay, any questions so far? Yes, please. For this case? Yeah, for yeah. So this one is strictly positive definite. So gradient of second derivative of fx star plus, this is a zero matrix, so I don't care about it. So if I look at second derivative of fx star multiplied by d transpose on this side and d on this side, it has to be greater than or equal to zero because it's positive definite. Any other question? Okay. Now, this is a candidate optimal solution because it satisfies the necessary conditions for optimality. In fact, it satisfies both the first order condition and second order condition. But still, we cannot conclude that this is the optimal solution because it doesn't satisfy sufficient condition or at least we haven't learned what the sufficient conditions for optimality for this particular problem is. So let's talk about that. It satisfies what we have learned so far. I have a convex problem with linear constraint. I have done the calculation using the Lagrange multiplier theorem. And I have identified a candidate solution and the corresponding Lagrange multiplier pair. But I don't know whether this is a uh, optimal or not optimal. So let's do the sufficient conditions for optimality. Let's learn what the sufficient conditions for optimality is. And I'm not going to go into the proof because the proof is fairly complicated uh, and uh, more involved than what the proof for Lagrange multiplier theorem was. So we won't do the proof, but I'll tell you what the statement of sufficient condition is. Suppose there exists x star, x star in Rn and lambda star in Rm such that this condition holds this condition holds for all d in Vx star such that d is not equal to 0. then x star is a strict local minimum. So I have strict local minimum. If these two conditions are satisfied, oh, uh, I should make it strictly positive. So there are two changes from the necessary condition. One is, do I have a colored chalk here? No, there are none. OK. So there are two changes. One is, I have strict inequality sign here. The second change is I have d not equal to zero here. Those are the two main changes from the necessary conditions for optimality.
Okay. Okay, so let's look at what the sufficient condition says. Suppose I have two points, x star in Rn and lambda star in Rm, that satisfies two conditions. It has to satisfy both these conditions. The first condition is that the first derivative of f plus blah, blah, blah is equal to zero. This is very similar to the first order necessary conditions for optimality. But look at this, the, the second condition, this, which needs to be satisfied by this x star lambda star pair. So d transpose the same second derivative term that we had in the earlier case, the second order necessary condition case, times d has to be strictly positive for all d, which is first order feasible variation at x star, and d is not equal to zero. So d has to be a non-zero vector in vx star and it should satisfy this particular condition. So if these two conditions are satisfied simultaneously, then x star is a strict local minimum for this optimization problem. Strict local minimum, which means that you move away from x star, your cost is going to increase. But you can't move in any direction. You can only move along the, the, the direction where h of x is equal to zero. So you are at the surface, you're standing at x star, and you move away from x star along and continue to stay on the surface, your x star would be a local, strict local minimum. So your function value is going to increase along all the directions that are feasible. Now go, going back to this particular example, we had this x star and lambda star that satisfied this condition. In fact, that's how we derived the value of x star and lambda star. And then we checked the second part, and it, it satisfied the second order necessary conditions for optimality. But let's see if it satisfies the sufficient conditions for optimality or not. So the, the, the first, first part is automatically satisfied by this. The second part. We have the same result. Now let's look at d transpose the second derivative d. Now this is a po strictly positive definite matrix. So this is strictly greater than 0 for all d not equal to 0. So it does satisfy the second order sufficient, I mean the, the sufficient conditions. And therefore, x star lambda star is optimal is a strict local minimum. Any questions or comments? Anything unusual that you want to, that you notice and you want to share with us with this result? So we have a convex problem. We have linear constraint. This is as simple as it can get. And the only thing I could conclude here is that it's a strict local minimum, okay? We haven't yet concluded that it's a global minimum. And in order to conclude that this is a global minimum, we'll have to wait for another one month. Okay, so, so I hope you will have that patience. Uh, by early November, we'll talk about geometric multipliers and we'll talk about duality gap. And when we, when we are studying that subject, we will show that problems of this type have zero duality gap. And therefore, uh, Anything that satisfies these conditions would be a global minimum. So we'll have to wait for a month to get there. 
But, but this is a more general result. You have a convex, you have a convex uh, objective function, you have linear constraints. As long as a solution exists, uh, it will be the optimal solution. But we'll have to talk about a lot of machinery before we are able to establish that result. Okay, any question on this? Yes, please. Strict local minimum means that if, uh, what's the difference between a strict local minimum and a local minimum? Oh, so a local, okay, very good question. Uh, let me erase this side of the board. So this point is a local minimum, but not a strict local minimum. Okay, because if you move along this direction, your function value is the same. So it's not strict. Okay, that's the difference. So when I say a strict local minimum, I'm only looking at the points where hx is equal to zero. Any other question? Okay. So in, in, in now I'm, I want to introduce the concept of Lagrangian. For optimization problem of this type, it's denoted by L of x comma lambda. Okay, so it's a function of two uh, vectors, one is x which is in Rn and lambda which is in Rm and it's given by f of x plus lambda transpose h of x. Alternatively I can write it as f of x plus summation lambda i h of x h i i equals 1 to m. That's my Lagrangian. Okay. Now let's look at these two conditions here. What is the first term? Uh, I mean, the, this particular equation. So this equation is actually gradient of x l x star lambda star. So let me just write it as gradient of x is gradient of f x plus summation lambda i gradient of h i x. So that's obviously the first derivative of the Lagrangian and let's look at the second derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x that is M, M, sorry, yes, you are right. Can someone tell me what is gradient of L with respect to lambda? summation of this one. So I'm doing derivative with respect to lambda. Lambda is a vector, so it has to be a vector. So 
So the question is, what's the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to lambda? Sorry? Yes, it is the HX, that's right. So this is just the HX. I forgot to mention that this X star, of course, has to be feasible here, which means that H of X star must be equal to zero. You can't take a point that is far away from the surface. OK. So you will notice that the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to X and the second derivative of Lagrangian with respect to X actually appears in both the necessary conditions for optimality and sufficient, uh, sufficient condition for optimality. So this term in particular is actually the first derivative of Lagrangian with respect to x. So what it is saying is sufficient condition is saying is that the first derivative of the Lagrangian should be equal to 0. And this is the second derivative of Lagrangian, this term inside the bracket. So, so you can replace this term with the second derivative of Lagrangian and you can rewrite the necessary condition and sufficient conditions for optimality purely in terms of the Lagrangian. So let me do that next. I'm going to erase this part, this side. So my first order necessary condition is gradient of x l x star lambda star equal to 0 gradient of lambda L x star lambda star equals to 0. But this is also equal to H of x star is equal to 0. So in fact, the derivative of Lagrangian must vanish at the optimal point in Lagrange multiplier pair. The second order necessary condition is D transpose First derivative of Lagrangian is zero. So I can write the entire uh, necessary condition and sufficient condition purely in terms of the derivatives of Lagrangian. Okay, so whenever we give you, uh, whenever an optimization problem, a constraint optimization problem with equality constraint is given to you, the first step is to construct the Lagrangian. 
The second step is to compute these derivatives and set it equal to zero. And you will have n n m plus n equations, m plus n unknowns. So notice here, you have m plus n equation and m plus n unknowns. So x star, lambda star, those are the unknowns. And now you have m plus n equations. You can solve it. Well, in the case of uh, if these are linear equations, you can solve it by hand or by using MATLAB. If they are nonlinear equations, then of course you have to rely on MATLAB for solving it. But you can solve this m plus n equation with m plus n unknowns. Uh, uh, if you have to check that you are at the truly optimal point, not just the candidate optimal point, then you have to check these two conditions as well. And once you check these two conditions, you are guaranteed to be at the optimal point, well, at a local minimum. Not a global minimum, but just a local minimum. That's why Lagrangians are important. Now, when we talk about algorithms for solving constraint optimization problems, Lagrangian will be extensively used throughout the optimization process. So we'll start talking about algorithms for solving constraint optimization probably uh, from after the break. After the spring break is over, sorry, the fall break is over, we'll talk about algorithms for solving problems of this type. Where this Lagrangian and the derivatives and the second derivatives, all of these terms will be used because they are crucial for designing algorithms that converges to stationary points. Okay, any questions so far? When we talk about constraint optimization problems, the stationary point, of course, x star is a stationary point, but it's, you, don't, you don't talk about stationary point in vacuum. You also have to talk about lambda star, which is the corresponding Lagrange multiplier pair. So the stationary point would require the point itself and the corresponding Lagrange multiplier, lambda star. And of course, the derivative, the, both the derivatives have to vanish at x star comma lambda star. OK, so that was Lagrange multiplier theorem. Now, the next topic that I want to discuss is uh, what is known as KKT theorem, karush kun tucker theorem. And the idea for that particular, so this is an equality constraint problem. KKT theorem is more general because it also addresses inequality constraint problems. So you could have a mix of equality and inequality constraints. So let's talk about KKT theorem, uh, which, is a, which is a necessary condition for optimality for that particular situation. So I'm going to erase this side. Karush Kun Tucker theorem. And these guys came up with the results sometime in 1950s. If I'm not mistaken, Kun was a faculty in Princeton and Tucker was a student. And this was part of his PhD thesis. But I may be a little bit wrong about this history. But I know that some of these people were, Kuhn was in Princeton and Tucker was in some way a student of Kuhn or somehow related. They were in the same thesis committee or something like that. And this theorem was established in 1950s. Has anyone seen a movie called Beautiful Mind? Some of you have seen the movie Beautiful Mind. So I think Tucker should be there in that movie somewhere. <laughs> he, he's, he was not the main character, but he should be in that movie because that movie is set in Princeton in 1950s. OK. So here is the problem. I want to minimize the function f of x such that h of x equal to 0 and g of x is less than or equal to 0. So h is a function 
that are m such function and there are r such functions inequality constraints okay now remember when we talked about the equality constraint problem we talked about the the notion of a regular point so we need to talk about what it means for a point to be regular when we are looking at problems with both equality constraints and inequality constraints so here is the definition x o oh. so the set of active constraints so the set of active constraints we have seen this before it's all the indices such that gj of x is equal to 0 and then x star is regular sorry x is regular if and only if a uh, gradient of h1x gradient of hmx gradient of gjx uh linearly independent that's the definition of a regular point so i have two constraints here both of them are inequality constraints so i want my g2 of x to be less than equal to 0 i want g1 of x to be less than equal to 0 and if i look at this point there are no active constraints there if i look at this point there is only one active constraint which is 1 so the set of active constraint is only one here the set of active constraint is just one uh, surface which is g2 so 2 is the only active constraint here and at this point both 1 and 2 are active constraints okay we have seen this before in the context of manifold sub optimization method and the idea is exactly the same in this particular situation as well okay so no active constraint one active constraint and then two active constraints here okay and so now x is a regular point if the set of all vectors gradient of h1 all the way to gradient of hm and then the derivative of gj for all j that are active these all form a linearly independent set of vectors okay so that's the meaning of a regular point so we have extended what we have done is we have looked at the set of 
regular points in the equality constraint problem. And now we have been able to extend that definition to inequality constraint problems by just looking at the derivatives for all the vectors that are, for all the constraints that are active at that particular point. So what we are going to do in the next class is we will talk about KKT theorem. We are not going to go into the proof. We'll talk about KKT theorem. We'll talk about sufficient conditions for optimality. And then we'll talk about an important concept called sensitivity theorem, which is uh, related to this particular concept. So uh, we'll talk about those three theorems in the next class or perhaps in the class on Monday. So see you on Friday. <laughs>